that uh, I chose this topic really was a conversation I had with some of my circle of athletic trainers. And I teach introduction to athletic injuries and athletic conditions. And sickle cell is usually like two slides in, in my lessons. So in talking to some of my athletic training colleagues, I, I kept asking them, well, how many have you had? What have you done? And the majority have, have said, I've never had any. So, um, and I personally had never had any that I know of. Now after doing all this research, uh, even my husband and I, because we worked together for nine years, I was the athletic trainer, he was one of the uh, varsity football coaches, you know, we're kind of going back and forth going, wait, what about that kid? Wait, what about that kid? I'm gonna try to keep these bubbles off. Um, just so you know a little bit about what's been going on here, um, I dropped my computer yesterday, and since I teach introduction to athletic injuries, I tell my students they have to have a first aid kit, and of course I have to uh, work along with that, and so I have band-aids to fix my broken screen. I don't know if it interrupts this or not. Uh, hopefully not. Okay, the internet just stopped on me. Internet helper. Where's my internet guy? He died. Sorry. Anyway, as we're fixing this, I got to talk to about a dozen people about sickle cell. And so on one of these slides that I have um, has quotes from the different people I interviewed, athletic trainers, uh, football coaches. I have Justin Kerrigan, who's the head football coach at UT Permian Basin, and he said, from a coach's perspective, uh, he never wants an athlete to go down. He wants to know that they have it. He wants to be prepared to help take care of it. Um, and just those simple steps of knowing and knowing what to do and what to look for with his athletes is huge. Um, I talked to Dr. Michelle Kirk. She, I'll introduce her a little bit later in the presentation. She is a, a sports medicine physician, has eight sickle cell athletes under her care currently right now. And boy, she gave me a whole lot of, too much information it seemed like. Uh, but she said the key is knowing, just flat out knowing. Uh, and she was even saying, even in her own medical community, speaking with other physicians, they don't really know. Uh, I spoke to two athletes that have sickle cell trait. I'm actually going to share their story if we can. Uh, I have it here on my pad, so I may be able to walk you through the slides if we can't get the internet on, and I'll try to be entertaining even though you're looking at a white screen. I'm sorry. Um, but anyway, I talked to two different athletes. One of them said, oxygen is my best friend, and another one, well, both of them basically said, we want everyone to know our story. a second. Okay, so the probably the only thing that I may have a little trouble with is the video. This is Ryan Clark. He played NFL. He was a safety for the Pittsburgh Steelers. You may be familiar with him. Back in 2007, I believe it was, he uh, had a game up in Mile High Stadium, uh, up in Denver. And 
because of his sickle cell trait, he's known about his sickle cell trait. Um, he played with it. He learned how to manage it, uh, followed all the guidelines that they were supposed to have. He still got sick. He still had an episode. And everyone that I've talked to about this condition said uh, it's called an episode. It's not just, hey, they're having cramps. It's not, uh, you know, they're feeling bad. It's an actual episode, and it is a medical emergency. In his case, uh, he developed pain on the left side of his uh, body uh, during the game. It was pretty intense enough. He had the positive curse sign. They rushed him to the emergency room. His spleen was enlarged. He actually lost his spleen and he lost his gall gallbladder uh, that night. Um, Next, if, if you have followed his story, the next few times that he was supposed to go up to Mile High Stadium, they said, you can go, but you cannot play. So for the next four years that he was part of the NFL, actually he was in the NFL just a little bit longer than that, um, he did not get to play whenever they played Denver, especially when it was Denver at home. Ended up retiring, he's doing well, really isn't having any issues. He's one of the really neat success stories when it comes to sickle cell. Another story is not as successful. Uh, there is debate about uh, his death. Um, this was, uh, actually I was introduced to him by one of my own former athletes who plays for the Canadian Football League. And I called up my, my former athlete and I said, so in all this time that you've been playing, how, did you have any of your teammates or did you, because I didn't know if he had it or not, um, uh, deal with anyone with sickle cell trait? And he says, yes, um, I did. Uh, so with this, this was his teammate, uh, I just went blank on his name, Clarksdale. Clarksdale. Um, he uh, played for uh, Tulsa University, was a starter, uh, and what my, my athlete said is the biggest thing for him was that he would cramp very easily because of it. So hydration, IV, and electrolytes were always ready. Um, he would have to get an IV during every halftime for every game. So this was just uh, part of the routine. He said when they were doing conditioning drills up in Tulsa with his teammate, he would have to actually uh, take longer breaks, especially when they had the time running or when they had the conditioning sprints. Uh, always oxygen on the field, always IVs available for this. He actually was injured after graduation. He was coaching, and part of a church fundraiser was an unboxing match for the church. Got hit pretty hard. The news clipping at first said, well, you know, it, it, this, his death is due to this injury. Uh, we think he broke his neck, and that's what killed him. When the autopsy came out, uh, basically he said it was a sickling, exertional rhabdomyolysis due to sickling. And so the sickling that has gone on in his body for years and years had done enough damage. Yes, the injury at the boxing match did, in the autopsy report, did uh, he had a severed C5 very debilitating, but according to the autopsy report, it wasn't the neck injury that killed him. It was the sickle cell uh, that did kill him, Un unfortunately. What we do know, uh, we know what sickle that there is sickle cell disease. And just, just so I can get kind of a feel, how many of you all have had a sickle cell trait or a sickle cell disease athlete? Okay, so bigger than my little group of uh, friends, so hopefully uh, I'm, I'm giving information that is helpful or, or just reiterating something you already know. So I'm going to go over a little bit about sickle cell disease. I'll go over uh, some of the signs that goes behind it. I will go over the definition of sickle cell trait. I'll talk a little bit about hemoglobin. Thalassemia is another condition. We're not really going to see our athletes with thalassemia. Uh, for purposes of time in this presentation, I actually did take out these slides, uh, but Natalie has said that the original PowerPoint that I provided for her, she will upload as my handouts, and so you'll have all that information, including the thalassemia and the autopsy report and all those other videos that I had added on in. And then I'll talk a little bit about exertional rhabdomyolysis. Sickle cell disease, and this is quoted from the Center of, Dis uh, Disease, Consor uh, Center of Disease Control, is a group of inherited blood cell disorders. You have healthy red blood cells, and they're round, they go, they're here at the lungs, they pick up the oxygen, and then they travel throughout the body wherever they need to go and deliver oxygen, you know, to your toe, to your foot, to your brain, wherever it needs to be, picks up the carbon dioxide, travels again in the, in the vessels, getting back to the lungs, making that exchange, and on and on and on. So that is what a normal, healthy person's body will do. Someone with sickle cell disease, uh, their red blood cells actually become hard and sticky. 
They're a little bit C-shaped. I, I say it's more like a pickle shape. The official terminology is a sickle shape. But if you think of the shape of a pickle that you just pull out of a plastic jar, that's almost the, the way they're designed. Um, what they do is they're going through the blood vessels. They get stuck. They clog. Their lifespan is not very long either. A normal red blood cell lasts about 120 days. A sickled red blood cell has a lifespan of 10 to 20 days. So your body is just not. Someone that has sickle cell disease or sickle cell trait, by the way, sickle cell disease and sickle cell anemia is interchangeable, interchangeable term. Um, they're not getting the oxygen they need. They're not getting um, the nutrients to the rest of their body that their, their body is craving, and thus with the problems we have. There are several different types of sickle cell disease. I focus on just the few most common ones that we see. Um, HBSS, the sickle cell, uh, the, or the person that has sickle cell anemia slash sickle cell disease has inherited it from both of the parents. Parent mom has, ha has sickle cell trait. Dad has sickle cell trait. They have the S uh, deviation, which is the sickle cell. Uh, basically, it's two genes that come together. They get both of the genes, and this is the most severe form of the disease. There are athletes with sickle cell disease, uh, but they're not the ones that you're seeing in football. They're not the ones that you're seeing in track. They're doing more of the low-impact type sports. I'll talk a little bit about lifespan in a few minutes with someone with sickle cell disease and, and what their lifestyle is like. Um, sickle cell SC, they're, in set, uh, they're inheriting one sickle cell trait from one parent, and they're getting, from the other parent, they're getting a hemoglobin uh, trait called C. It's, it's, a, it's a, still a deformity in the hemoglobin, but it's not as severe. Uh, this person, if, especially if they get both, uh, both genes will have sickle cell anemia. They'll have the same reactions. It's not as severe as SS, uh, but it's still enough that it is a concern for those that are active. Uh, beta thal thalassemia, like I said, I, I took out a lot of this section uh, with thal thalassemia just because of time constraints. Uh, but basically, they're, again, inheriting from both parents. It actually is, a, a, depending whether it's alpha or beta thalassemia, it could be very severe. You're not only just having sickling in the cells, you actually have face deformities, abdominal distension, all sorts of other issues. Okay, and there are other few other milder forms of sickle cell, E, D, and O, that um, if you want more information on that, I'm more than happy to share with you. So looking under a microscope slide, to your, I have to do my left and my right, <laughs> to your left is a normal red blood cells. So you can see they're, they're round, they they're have a good color, um, they're ready to travel through the vessel, they're not really going to be getting stuck. On the right side, you'll see those that have kind of a pickling, and I'll kind of draw a little bit here. Does that show up for you guys? Um, it, it, it does. It looks like a pickle. Or, or, and so if you imagine they have these cells going through a very small blood vessel and getting stuck because they're sticky, they're blocking the good red blood cells from doing what they need to do. Ramifications of sickle cell disease. It is a chronic illness. Okay, there is... There's debate right now about whether there is a cure or there's not a cure, and I'll go into that in just a second. But it does need constant care, and it does need constant monitoring. Uh, those that I did discuss the, uh, the condition of the disease with them have talked to me about blood transfusions, about uh, the treatments, about the lifespan. It is not something that you can just ignore and think, well, I'm not going to worry about it. It's not really that big of a deal if I don't want to play sports. Even if the, that person with a disease does not want to play sports, they are going to be affected in some way, shape, or another. Um, it is linked to hand foot syndrome, definitely a lot of pain, anemia, infection, acute, ch uh, acute chest syndrome, vision loss, ulcers, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism. You get the, you get the drift. They're going to be very sick individuals. Life expectancy. Back in the 1970s, life expectancy of someone with sickle cell disease, sickle cell anemia, was about 14 years old. With studies and with treatments that have uh, developed since the 1970s, life expectancy now is anywhere from 45 to 50 years, women living longer than men. Who's affected? It's a genetic condition. You can't catch it. You can't get it from a bad blood transfusion. Um, and then there's also the, the, I guess, the impression that only African Americans get it. So I wanted to introduce this fact to you, that it is most common in those of African descent, 
So in the U.S. population, about 12% of African Americans at least have sickle cell trait, okay? But it is also found in people of Hispanic origin, Greeks, Italians, East Indians, Saudi Arabians, Asians, there's actually a trait named after a, a Chinese uh, group, um, Syrians, Turks, Cypriots, Sicilians, Caucasians. So out of all the students that you have playing under you, there is a good chance one, two, five of them could have the trait. They could have that genome. Um, but basically looking at people with origins from Africa, the Mediterranean area, India, South Central uh, America, and Saudi Arabia. What is the treatment for sickle cell disease? Number one is blood transfusions. Number two is pain medicine. It is a very painful condition. Um, I don't, I'm hoping my video will, will work of an athlete that has an episode going on and, and see how it's not just a cramp. I, we've all have seen our athletes go and have cramps and we're going and rubbing it out and then, you know, get the pickle juice, get the mustard packs and they're okay, sort of. Um, this is a very, very painful situation and it lasts more than a few minutes. Um, they do need to increase their fluids. One of the interviews that I had with an athletic trainer out in New Jersey that has a sickle cell disease and a sickle cell trait um, athlete, one of each, uh, said she went to an in-service and basically was told these kids need to be drinking 100% amount of fluid compared to their weight. In our bodies, uh, we have 55 to 60 per 55 to 60% water in our bodies. So that means they are drinking uh, you know, their weight is uh, almost 100% of their weight. So if they weigh 100 pounds, they should be having about 100 ounces a day. Of course, we need to add electrolytes to that. We need to add sodium and potassium to that. Um, but it is something that they just cannot take for granted. They need to eat healthy. And I'll share a little bit of that with Kyrie's story. They need to be up to date in their vaccines. They are more susceptible to getting sick. So MMR, all the vaccines that, that happen, you know, throughout the life, Time they need to go ahead and follow through with to prevent any type of in injuries. There are um, there is a train of thought that those w that are identified with sickle cell disease need to be on prophylactic medicine, and so they are on penicillin or some type of antibiotic really from birth to about five to seven years. Okay, and this is for those with a sickle cell disease that they have trait from the both sides of the parent. Is there a cure? There is a potential cure. They know that if you get a bone marrow transplant or stem cell, cell stem transplant, you can be cleared from it. But you have to have an identical match. And usually that identical match is from a family member. Um, there has been some gene therapy done in Paris this past March. And there was an article in CNN, and I haven't found the medical journals that go along with it. Uh, I'm sure they're coming pretty soon, if, unless I just missed it in my research. But there is a, a teenager that has potentially been cured. They started treatment when this teenager was about 13 years old. It went for about 15 months doing this gene therapy. And now this teenager does not have to have blood transfusions, does not have to have medicines, has not had a sickling event in quite a while. And so they're con considering him cured. Um, at this time, he's won. Uh, there are still so many other studies that need to be done before they can say, hey, we can cure this disease. So understanding sickle cell trait. Sickle cell trait is the ones that inherit one sickle cell gene and one normal gene. So mom may have the trait, dad does not have the trait, child has a one in four chance of getting the, uh, well, actually three in four chance of getting the trait. Um, if you remember Punnett squares uh, from uh, our college, uh, genetics classes, basically if mom and dad each have the trait one, and have four children, the chances are one will have nothing, one will have disease, and two will have the trait. Most people with sickle cell trait do not have any symptoms, but we do need to identify it. Um, rare cases, and, and the more research I did, this, this uh, statement really doesn't hold true, but it says in rare cases, people with SCT might experience complications, such as pain crises. The more research I did, the more I found out those with sickle cell trait are very likely to have an episode of pain crisis. Whether they understand it's because of the activity or it's just their body isn't acclimating to uh, altitude, humidity, whatever it can be. It may be minor, it may be severe. In the extreme four, in, a very, in very rare cases, 
this is what can be harmful to those with sickle cell trait. Going into uh, uh, pressure in the atmosphere, so scuba diving, okay, the deeper you go, the more pressure there is, and so it can cause a sickling event, very painful, could actually, you know, underwater definitely be de deadly. Low oxygen levels in the air. Uh, mountain climbing, when you're going higher elevation, you know that the oxygen levels are lower. When you're exercising, when we're going through two-a-days with football or any other sport, um, our athletes are, are if, especially if they're not in shape, they're, they're basically sucking wind, and so they're trying to get air into their body. Um, even though so one of the, the doctors that I talked to even said uh, asthma and sickle cell trait in a lot of cases go hand in hand. So if you know that your athlete has sickle cell trait and they have asthma, you need to be even more alert. I think I'll talk about that in a little bit. High altitudes uh, will affect, just the way pressure, the, uh, high pressure will affect, high altitudes can affect sickling uh, events. Exertional rab rhabdomyolysis and exertional collapse are associated with sickle cell trait. These can lead to death. And the sooner that we can identify it, the sooner that we can get emergency help, the better chance we have of saving these athletes or, or just anyone with a trait. So let me go into the boring science-y stuff for just a minute, and then I'll go into a couple of stories of uh, some athletes that I really got to know. So hemoglobin, how it's built. It's a complex protein based of alpha and beta chains. Before you're born, you, are, you have your alpha chains but you're actually, uh, instead of the beta chains, you have the gamma chains. About two, three months, anywhere from uh, two, three months to about five months, your body gradually is replacing those gamma chains with the beta chains. And so a healthy individual, when they're about four or five months old, will have two alpha, two beta uh, uh, chains in their hemoglobin. In their hemoglobin. Oops, hitting the wrong one. Um, hemoglobin is carried by the red blood cells. The main function, as I mentioned before, is to carry oxygen throughout the body. Uh, complex characteristics of the hemoglobin, tetramer permit the control of the oxygen to uptake in the lungs, travel, release, pick up carbon dioxide, travel back, pick up more oxygen, and it's just a cycle. The way I describe it to my high school kids and some of my college students, I'm like, it's a choo-choo train that just keeps on going. And sickle cell makes that train stop when it really needs to go. There are several different types of hemoglobin. I mentioned the prenatal hemoglobin, which is hemoglobin F. It's the third dot right there. And what you have there during fetal development, you have two alpha chains and two gamma chains. And so as I mentioned, at, at right after birth, it changes the alpha chain. I mean, the alpha chains stay the same. The, beta, the gamma chains change into beta chains. And so a normal, healthy individual will have that. There are, there's a small percent of the population that their beta, instead of getting beta chains, they actually get two delta chains. It doesn't really affect them in a very negative way. It gradually will, if they're a normal, normal healthy individual, will gradually get back to hemoglobin type A. Variant types. This is the, the types that we start worrying about when um, the, the children are being tested. Hemoglobin S is a predominant type in people with sickle cell disease. It contains your normal alpha change, but your beta chain, a mutation exists that is identified as a sickle cell mutation. Okay, so someone with one mutation would have the trait. Someone with two mutations will have the disease. Uh, hemoglobin C results from a mutation in the beta globin gene, so it's not as strong. Uh, what is happening with uh, sickle cell uh, version C, I mean hemoglobin version C, is that your body is not creating as many red blood cells. And thus, with not having enough red blood cells, plus you have some of the sickling blood cells, your body doesn't have the cells to bring enough oxygen. And on top of that, you're having some sickling events. It is not as dangerous as uh, hemoglobin S, but it is, a, it is a factor. And then if they inherit both genes, the S and the C uh, hemoglobin, uh, it, it can interact, and so they uh, can either end up with sickle cell disease, definitely having sickle cell issues with sick because they have the trait. I hope I'm making sense with that. All this sciencey stuff makes me have a headache. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Other variants: E, constant spring, H, and Bart. A couple things to just mention of those with, with, without going into all the details when it comes to the hemoglobin. With E and constant spring, these are more of a milder 
type of variation, a very mild mutation, but it is a mutation. They are still considered to have the sickle cell trait. Uh, they usually deal with anemia, they deal with uh, splenomegaly. Uh, in constant spring, these, uh, this is mainly found along ethnically Chinese people in the central, I mean, constant spring district of Jamaica. H and BART are a little bit more uh, severe, a lot more severe. Uh, with H, instead of getting the A's and the B's, you're basically getting four beta globin. So you're not getting the cells to work at all the way they're supposed to. Uh, BART develops as in fetuses. Uh, majority of the time, uh, anyone with hemoglobin BART will not uh, live to, to birth. Going into exertional rhabdomyolysis, I'm sure we've all heard of this. We hear about it with CrossFit, we hear, hear about it with uh, bike spinning, and we hear about it with sickle cell trait. It is associated with hyper and hyperthermia type of conditions. And that's one of the things that we, or at least me, when I was doing my research, I didn't realize that cold conditions could affect someone with a sickle cell trait. But yes, cold can very definitely affect just as well as the heat can. Uh, there are some other ischemic conditions that can lead to exertional rhabdomyoly rhabdomyolysis, uh, but for the most part, my focus here is on the sickle cell trait. Signs and symptoms, pain, tenderness, weakness, swelling in the muscles. So they are going to be complaining of pain like cramping. And they'll say that, I'm cramping, I'm cramping really bad. But then you go and to rub out the cramp. If you're like me, I'll go out there and I'll come rub out the cramp. And whatever that muscle is, is like jello instead of hard as a rock. Um, it's usually affected after engaging in physical activity. It could actually be at the very beginning of the physical activity. It doesn't have to be they've been out there 30 minutes, 45 minutes, hour, an hour, whatever. It can actually happen in the first five minutes of physical activity. Consequences, muscle ischemia, cardiac arrhythmia, and possibly death. This is considered a true medical emergency. You know they have the sickle cell trait. They're starting to have the signs and symptoms. Part of your emergency plan is to call the ambulance, and I will go more into detail in just a sec with that. So I've given you all this sciencey information. Now I'm going to kind of give you some stories that uh, hopefully will help us relate uh, a little bit better as to what a sickle cell trait person is going through. How is it identified? Who knows what? Uh, they're testimonies of two athletes I got to know, and I totally love these guys. And just recommendations from the boys, uh, a team physician, and, and some other athletic trainers that I had a chance to talk to. Identifying sickle cell trait and sickle cell disease. Everybody born in the United States is tested at birth, okay? And, and this has been going on for more than 20, 30 years. In the 1970s, there was some identification uh, of the disease, but there wasn't a flat out screening. Now, uh, you, basically it's called more than drops of a card. I actually spoke to two people at the Texas Department of Health about the testing. And they're like, yes, the, the baby gets tested, the information is sent to the state, they have really a turnaround of about 48 hours to, to run the exam and say, oops, this person is testing positive for SCT, let's contact their doctor, contact the parents, give them a heads up, let's educate them. That is the whole goal of the testing, okay? How many of your athletes do you think know the results of that card? Pretty much none. Or there's a, there's a few, but if, uh, well, I'll go into it, well, I guess it's on this slide. Question number 18 on the UIL pre-participation form. In my 25 years of being an athletic trainer, I have never had a yes. Even when I've had it at the college level, I have never had a yes. Going through this, I'm just thinking of kids like, are you sure? I could have sworn you could be, a, you know, just looking back. Um, and, and I do, I tease my... Um, my students, I'm like, how much of the paperwork do you actually read? Or are you just signing? And, and even when my son was starting to get ready for athletics, I made him sit and read the paperwork. It was very, very boring, uh, but I made him do it because I want him to understand. You know, and I tease the kids. If they're not reading, I'm like, well, you just signed a million dollars over to me. Thanks. You know, appreciate it. But it is asked. In our UIL paperwork, it is asked, do you have sickle cell disease or have been identified with a trait? NCAA, okay, so going over to the college level, that side show up, okay, uh, there is in the NCAA uh, information page and, and in the handbook, 
these are the requirements. There has to be existing documentation from birth. So either getting that card from the hospital from when you were first born, or a recent screening. Most uh, students entering college at this point have been tested. I think in Texas, officially, they've been tested since uh, late 80s, early 90s. So those football, um, well, those athletes in general that are entering college, most of them were born, what, 93, 94, something like that. So they should have been tested. There is a waiver option. But in declining the waiver, um, they have to go through, they have to prove, uh, they have to be given the option to understand. They have to go through the education saying, okay, this is what sickle cell trait is. You're waiving the option to know whether you do or do not have it. We do recommend that you do get it. But I've even had some coaches and athletic directors say, well, you can't practice until the tests come back, so we're not going to let you um, so that gives the, I guess, the athlete the, the mindset like, well, no, I want to play. I don't want to wait for this test to come back. Um, and so they'll sign the waiver, and it's very, very unfortunate. But according to the NCAA, if, uh, they need to be first provided education by the institution, the implications of exercise, um, and understand the risk, impact, and precautions associated with a sickle cell trait if they were to plan to participate. As I said before, we don't usually see sickle cell disease our sickle cell anemia at these levels. Usually at this point, they are either really sick or they know their limitations. So it's very, very rare. I still haven't found a case where someone it was a college player or someone was a pro player that had sickle cell disease. So Herschel's story. This is one of the football players that I got to interview. I actually talked to his mom first. She is a coach's wife, so just out of a coach's wife's conversation, I mentioned that, yeah, I'm doing this kind of uh, presentation. And she said, oh, I've got one for you. And so I'm going to try to stick with my PowerPoint so I make sure I don't miss any of these uh, uh, factors. But th this is an interesting factor. She was his kindergarten teacher. She is not his biological mo mother. She is his biological. Uh, she was his kindergarten teacher and had become very friendly with Herschel's birth mother. Um, at that time, Herschel's birth father uh, had uh, was positive for HIV. He was dying. All she could tell me, she says, I know he had HIV and he died about the time Herschel was in kindergarten. Not long after, birth mom gets breast cancer. Family's going to get to know each other, and, and mom says, I want you raising my son. Would you consider raising my son? Just to give you a little background of the birth mom and the birth dad. Birth dad was African American. Birth mom was Samoan. We are assuming, and, and, and Audra is assuming, that it was a dad with a sickle cell trait. But anyway, we didn't know anything at this point. After mom dies and the adoption happens, Audra and her husband think, you know, there's HIV in the background. She got cancer early. Why don't we go ahead and test him and just see what's going on, make sure that we can do whatever we can for this child so he has a normal, healthy life. So they go and test him, really thinking, we're just wanting an answer about HIV, and they find out he has a sickle cell trait. So until he was about seven, eight years old, he did not know he had sickle cell trait. They sit down with the doctor because, you know, the tests come in. The doctor has to say, this is what you got to do. This is what you got to do. All he said, okay, well, your blood work indicated you have sickle cell trait. Don't worry about it. It's really not an issue until you get married. When you get deciding to get married, you might want to ask the person you're going to marry if they have the trait. Because if both of you have the trait, the chance of having someone with sickle cell disease is very, very high. That was it. That was their education on it. So she goes on to tell me that as he started in athletics, you know, question number 18 came up, and she would write a whole big paragraph about it. You know, trying to make sure the athletic trainers knew. She tried to let the coaches know. Herschel never had any issues growing up. He did fine. Never really seemed to have a pain event. Uh, he was very active in football, basketball, and baseball. Um, as a family, they were real big on skiing. In the winter, they were real big on, on boating on the lake in the summer. She said the only issue he ever really had was in the cold. If they went out to the lake early in the spring when the water was still cold, he'd jump in the water to go swimming, and he'd come right back out because he'd break out in hives. He'd go skiing, and if he was exposed to the air, if he didn't wear all his gloves and cover up his face, he'd break out in hives. They'd give him Benadryl. He'd be fine in a day or two, went back out and, and did his activities. Never had a problem. Um, so 
in their eyes, they're like, well, that's not related to sickle cell. We're not worried about it. The doctor said not to worry about it. Voila. Okay? So that's his background. Now here's his version. She told me his version too, but then I'm going to, I went ahead and verified everything with him. Um, he said, I, I was part of Alito, and if you know anything about Alito's uh, teams, in the time he was in high school there, he was part of three football championships. He did play. He was a starter, I believe, his junior and his senior year. I don't know all the details of that. He did play in the baseball championship team. He was a starter. He never had an episode, not once. He says, well, you know, when I was in eighth grade, I think one time when we had to run around the outside of the stadium and it was a really hot day, my arms and legs did get really hot and really, like, heavy. But he goes, I just sat down. No coach was looking. I sat down for a little while. I felt better. And then I started finishing my run again. You know, and an eighth grader, he's like, no big deal. That's the only episode he can recall before the episode I'm going to share with you. So, uh, same as always, every time he had physicals, uh, question number 18, check yes, mom would actually get that paperwork and write that whole paragraph about he has, they had the same athletic trainer from what I understand uh, all four years. So, graduates from college, has all these championships, gets recruited by a Division II uh, baseball team up in Oklahoma. You know, he's excited, this is great, life is good, goes up to Oklahoma in the fall, has absolutely no problems. Right before winter break, coaches look, you need to lose a little bit of weight. He goes, I want you running. This is a workout I want you to do. Eat healthy. Let's get down about 5, 10 pounds. Baseball's going to start. You have a chance to be a starter as a freshman. He's very excited about this. Absolutely. Yes, I'm going to focus. And Audra did verify, because you know how a college student will say, oh, yeah, I ate right. Oh, yeah, I worked out. And, and we know the truth about those workouts, usually during winter. But uh, mom said, yes, he was running five miles a day. He was eating healthy. She said, really, the only day he ate bad was Christmas Day, because everybody ate bad on Christmas Day. Uh, so the holiday, he'd been doing good. It's time to go back to school. And uh, one of the things that he and, and Audra both mentioned very, very specifically is right before he left Fort Worth to head out to Oklahoma, he had a monster. He never had any monsters, but he had a monster. And he was supposed to pick up another a teammate on the way up to Oklahoma. Well, that particular winter was a very harsh winter. They had some detours trying to get back up. They got in very, very late at night was a big storm on the way there, but they got there. Next morning, they had to get up early and be out on the baseball field, so he didn't really eat anything. You know, he had had some snacks on the road during that whole crazy drive back up to school. Next morning, he didn't drink or eat anything. He just got up and went. It was 17 degrees out that morning. So coach starts him out, um, and, and he says, okay, well, you guys, we're going to be playing in this. You've got to get used to conditioning in this. Coach has him do sprints. He knows that he has to take break bef between sprints, even in cold weather. He takes his breaks. He's fine. Sprints, no big deal. All right, we're good to go. Uh, he's just really tired because it had been a crazy day on the drive up there. So now coach says, okay, it's time for the mile. You need to run it under 7.45. Awesome. He starts running. He's been running five miles for the last few weeks. He's like, I'm feeling good. He gets to the point where he's at the last 100 meters, and the coach yells out, 6.45. He's like, awesome, I'm doing good. And then all of a sudden, he said his legs went dead. And then his arms went like, dead. And then he got dizzy and started feeling like he was hyperventilating. He said he got to the end. He got the mile done right at 7.45. But those last 10 feet was crawling in. He didn't know what was going on. He's just, all of a sudden, his body just shut down. That had never happened before, except that maybe eighth grade situation, his body just completely shut down. You know, some of the other guys are saying, well, I have a stomach bug. He probably got it from me because we were hanging out together. Coach's wife is, is, you know, kind of the team mom. So she, they call, actually call Audra up, and they're saying, we're making him chicken soup. He collapsed on the field. Well, we think it's just a bug. We're taking him to his dorm, blah, blah, blah. When I talked to Herschel for his version of it, he says, all I remember is I crawled across the line and I passed out, and the next time I woke up, I was in my dorm room. Okay, kind of a scary situation. No medical care. He did get his chicken soup. It was great. He did get to talk to his mom. She gave him some comforting, but that was it. And he's just not getting his energy back after a couple days, so he decides, okay, I'm going to go ahead and go to the doctor. 
Um, in that interim time, and, and there's a long story, I got part of that story. In that interim time, there was not a head athletic trainer at that particular school. There were some student athletic trainers, and there was one that was there when baseball was working out. And this, this student kept saying, well, he has sickle cell disease, and this is a sickle cell disease thing. You know, and the coach and, and Herschel and mom were like, no, he has trait. And so they, they understood enough about the difference between trait and disease. They're like, no, honey, it's not disease, it's trait. This is not what it is. He's got the flu. I mean, that's what they kept trying to, to focus on. It's the flu. He's got a stomach flu. Uh, but he had no energy. Doc goes to the doctor, you know, again, reveals what had happened on the trip up, reveals that he has sickle cell trait. Doctor runs some blood work, and he says, it was a sickling event. He said, you collapsed because of your sickle cell trait. The cold triggered it. The lack of food triggered it. The lack of hydration triggered it. You need to take some time off and just rest. It will probably never happen again. You've learned your lesson. End of story. I hear some, yeah, right. <laughs> um, so because of his blood work, it took almost two months for him to get back to full clearance, which is real frustrating for him because he, he, he was a freshman. He really wanted to play. Um, so he finally gets cleared to play. He's excited. He's been feeling great. He's eating right. He's hydrating. He's carrying that gallon of water all the time. He's out at practices. He knows he needs to take breaks. And it's 98 degrees and high humidity. And the legs go dead again during a run. And this time, there was an athletic trainer on staff. This time, there was oxygen out at the field. This time, he was like, no, I'm not repeating this again. And so he stopped as soon as he felt the dead legs. Um, went back to the de same doctor. We're not really happy because the doctor had said, this will never happen again. Uh, but this time, they found some issues with his heart that he actually had to be referred out to a cardiologist. He was under the care of a cardiologist for about a month or so before he got cleared again. Uh, again, he's being told, it probably won't happen again. Probably won't happen again. Uh, so he ended up taking a medical red shirt, um, got picked up for summer ball in California, had absolutely no issues. I said, well, what part of California were you in? And he said he was at Laguna Beach. And I don't know very much about California, but I think Laguna Beach, just from the word beach, there's humidity, there's heat, no issues. OK, he learned how to manage it. Good for him. OK, he comes back to Oklahoma for the fall. The only problem, well, it may or may not have been a problem. There is a new coach. The other coach whose wife made chicken soup moved on somewhere else. So there's a new coach. Disclosed to the coach again about the trait, how he needs extra time with the reps, blah, blah, blah. Uh, coach is like, OK, whatever. Coach uh, has this, uh, he called it the six nines, where basically they're running pole to pole all across the field under nine minutes. And they have to make sure they make it in time. And coach was like, nine minutes. That's not going to be an issue for you. Marshall's like, well, you know, I've been feeling good. I haven't had an episode again. OK. Starts running it. Symptoms started again. Legs went dead. He's trying to impress the new coach. He's like, I can do this. I can do this. Starts feeling in the arms. He stops. There's oxygen at the field. There's an athletic trainer at the field. He, this time, EMS is called. Uh, coach says, I'm done with him. He's not making the team. He gets cut. Uh, it was devastating for him. It was a very difficult situation for him to, to deal with. Um, he did end up going back to Fort Worth. Uh, and this time, consulted with, uh, it was kind of a neat, I guess, uh, circle of uh, uh, coincidence, I guess. They met Dr. Kirk at church. Mom met Dr. Kirk at church. And Dr. Kirk is a team doctor for TCU and Fort Worth, and Fort Worth ISD with her uh, office, with her practice. And she's the one that has eight sickle cell athletes that she supervises. So she took him under hers. And she you know, said, OK, we're going to educate you, and we're going to educate your family on this. She says, you are never to do any more timed runs. She goes, yes, you can play baseball. You can play football. You can condition. But they cannot be timed. You know your body now. You know what the triggers are. Take a break. Um, if he needs to take longer rest, he can take longer rest. That's fine. Um, and one of the things that she recommends is that when they're running, let's say you have groups one, two, three when it comes to conditioning, and he's in group one. He does his run. He's not supposed to run again until group one pops up up front again. She says, no, you're not going to go with one again. You're going to go with two. Then he'll run with group two. Group two will pop up again. No, you're not going to run with group two. You're going to run with group three. And so that's what he's been doing. No problems at all. Sorry, my thing. I, I talk too much. 
Um, he keeps his pulse while running, especially on the treadmill. He said his threshold is 175 beats per minute. After about 175 beats per minute, he starts feeling the dead legs and he knows he needs to st uh, stop. He has access to oxygen. He limits his, his caffeine intake. He says, I, I still have sodas every now and then, but I've never had a monster again. I've never had one of those energy drinks again. Uh, he has increased his electrolytes, and he actually did meet with a nutritionist and making sure he has healthy eating habits. He wants the word out. I mean, when I called him, when I finally got to talk to him, I said, are you okay with me mentioning your name? Are you okay with me telling your story? He goes, absolutely. I want people to know that I came from a program that was so good, and the coaches understood, and the coaches worked with me, and even with them working with me, I still had an event. It can happen to anyone. Um, he believes that athletes, parents, doctors, coaches, and ATs need to work as a team. We need to communicate, and we need to understand what can happen and what to do in case an episode can happen. So I got a chance to interview Dr. Kirk. Let me give you a little bit of her background. She was really, really, enter not entertaining, but really energetic lady. She really believes uh, in, in what she's doing. Uh, she started, she's been practicing for 12 years. She actually started out a as a pediatrician. And then about two, three years into her pediatric service, she uh, went into sports medicine and got, uh, went to a sports medicine fellowship. Uh, she is part of a physician group that uh, supervises Fort Worth ISD sports. Uh, they are the team, official team doctors, uh, and she also helps out with some of the sports at TCU. Um, her concern is the parents are not educated about the condition. Remember I mentioned the cards? They get the cards, the doctor goes, oh, you have sickle cell trait, do this, this, and this, and you'll be okay. And that's really the whole conversation. She says, even when she's going to her medical conferences and she's trying to educate other physicians about sickle cell trait and the episodes that can happen and how dangerous they are, a lot of the doctors are like, that's only if they're really working out hard. And she said, I've got athletes and I've got regular kids that aren't working out that hard and are having the events, plus also the cold. Now we have the cold data to add to it from Herschel, and, and I think she had another athlete with the same type of situation. Uh, so she says, they know the book info, just kind of like we know the book info. We have those two slides in Arnheim that I teach. I mean, now it's now Prentice, sorry. Uh, in Prentice that we now teach. We do mention it. It is talked about. I test over it. But, you know, do my students go into detail about what sickle cell trait can do to a body? No, not really. It's really if we see it. Um, she gave me a little more information. In the United States, about 12% of the African-American population has sickle cell trait. She said, but what you need to watch, especially those at the college level, is your athletes coming directly from Africa. Because sickle cell trait fights off malaria, the majority of your athletes coming from Africa will be positive for sickle cell trait. So that just spikes up the numbers, okay? Um, just, I'm gonna come back to this slide in just a, a little bit about this, but I wanna I want kind of throw this out there. Her medical team did 2,000 physicals in the spring. Out of those 2,000 physicals, she said only three or four marked yes, okay? And we've already kind of talked about that. Y'all nodded, yeah, my athletes don't even know whether they have it or not. She said the key is knowing, identify the condition, and educate. She also says uh, on, the, on, on our part, and on the part of coaches and a part of uh, parents, hydrate, have oxygen available if at all possible, have a cooling off area, have rest periods, and access to IV fluids. Uh, she brought up about the testing for, condition, uh, for, con for the condition that has been happening since the 1970s, but again, parents not being educated. I mean, she just kept stressing that. Parents are not being taught. They don't know. Um, she said the key is to know what to look for. She asked when I talked to you all that in our emergency action plans that we add these couple lines. She said our em emergency action plan must include an ambulance for a sickling event. So if I know Joe has sickle cell trait and he's having cramping and screaming and I'm thirsty and I'm hot and I hurt, ambulance is gonna be just, you know, whether they give me a slap on the wrist or not, ambulance is gonna be called, okay? They get sent to the hospital. She said, pick up the call, uh, pick up the phone, call the hospital and say, I am sending an athlete, they have sickle cell trait. You know, and, and I know that when I've worked uh, with my teams and I have a hospital that I usually 
connect with most, I actually got to know the administrator. And so I could, uh, when I was in Odessa, I would text him and say, I'm sending da 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 and they'd get the word out to the ER, you know? So it just, wherever your uh, connections are, make sure that word gets out and let them know, yes, not only are they cramping up, but it isn't just a simple cramping up situation where they just need an IV. They have sickle cell trait, we need to pay attention to this. Um, she said, we need to have access to oxygen IV and IV fluids. Depending on your supervising physicians, I mean, I've been taught how to do an IV. I haven't done one since I was like, maybe first year out of college. I mean, I know how to do it. Uh, so it, it is something, if I ever go back to the clinical setting again, I'm gonna sit down and have a good long talk with my doctor about what do you want me to do with this. Um, and then the other thing she brought up was sickle cell trait and asthma. It, it does go hand in hand. It is a bad situation because you have oxygen actually being depleted from the body. Uh, and, athlete, and all caregivers should know that even if the athlete is in good shape and condition, episodes can and will happen. It isn't just those kids that have been playing Xbox all summer long and are not in shape when we start two-a-days again. It is kids that have been working out and doing the conditioning and going swimming or being active, you know, year-round. They are still susceptible to it. Uh, episodes will generally occur early in the workout with or with time runs. So it's not like, oh, you've been out there forever and it's going to happen again. So going back to the physicals from spring 2017, that just kind of threw up a red flag when she told me uh, about the 2000 physicals. So I went up and looked up what I could find about Fort Worth ISD statistics. Uh, and this is from, granted it's from star, the STAR data, so I'm assuming it's accurate, uh, but it says there are 22%, almost 23% African American, 60, about 63% Hispanic, and about 11% white. So we're looking at over 90% of their, uh, the potential athletes or the potential students in that st uh, school district may be susceptible to it, but only three or four checked yes. Just food for thought. Okay, Kyrie's story, and I'm hoping I can get this video to work. I really want uh, you to see this. Um, I got introduced to Kyrie through his athletic trainer. She's a, an athletic trainer in New Jersey, in Hamilton, uh, Hamilton Township, New Jersey. She is a full-time athletic trainer, does not have to teach, has kind of flexible hours. Uh, she covers all sports. They are still in school, actually, right now. They are not out of school yet. Um, Kyrie is a 17-year-old high school student. He is a running back in football. He's a sprinter in track. He's been doing sports pretty much all his life. Uh, when I talked to him, I said, well, what's your favorite event? He said, 400-meter run. I'm good. You know, and, and his dad wants him to be a college football player. His dad was a college football player, so he should be a football player, and that will be great. Um, one of the things, that, you know, and this is kind of having two separate conversations with Jen, the athletic trainer, and with Kyrie. Um, he has extra workouts. As I mentioned, his dad wants him to go college level. So you know with a lot of your athletes, they're not just doing their workouts at school. They're going to specialized training with a personal trainer or with some kind of organizational group. And so he's also from a broken home. He actually really much, pretty much lives with mom, uh, but dad gets him. Uh, in the, he gets him in after school for a few days so that he can go to this training and dad's there supervising it. So one of the issues, well, I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, mom is the one with the sickle cell trait. Mom was never an athlete. Mom has never, ever had an episode. So she's like, I don't, I don't get it. Dad does not have the sickle cell trait. And he, he actually refuses to get tested. But Kyrie has a half-brother that is also at the same school and on the same team. His half-brother is actually the quarterback. Kyrie is the, the running back. Um, so when Kyrie has episodes, that's like he's just being a big baby. You look at his brother. His brother never has these issues. But now there is documentation that he does have the sickle cell trait. Um, the coaches have been great. Once they found out he did have sickle cell trait and what to do about it, Jen was really good about going and educating herself about it and then turning right around and educating um, her coaches about it. I mean, right away they're calling her. She's got an oxygen tank. They're ready to go. Um, the first doctor that Kyrie uh, saw when Jen finally said, you have to go to the doctor, he said, well, you've got it, but you really don't need to worry about it. You're having some episodes. He goes, but I want you to drink enough water so that you pee every hour. That's it. So Jen and I are still, you know, this is the two conversations and we're talking about this. And she says, you know, one of the things with Kyrie is that he doesn't eat. The only meal he ever really gets 
is lunch at school. And if you all remember what school lunches are like, um, that's not a lot of calories. This doctor wanted him to eat between 3,500 and 4,000 calories. Because he's got after school training with his dad and that um, specialization program after school, he usually doesn't get home till late at night, back to his mom's. If she's not working, maybe she'll make something for dinner, but it's quick, and if she's working, he has to basically fend on his own. Morning, he's usually on his way to school in a hurry to go, so he doesn't really get, he'll pick up a snack or something. So he's not getting the 3,500 to 4,000 calories that the doctors want him to get. He did not know he had the, uh, the sickle cell trait until a little over a year ago. Uh, the video, if it works, I hope. Um, he had had about six or seven episodes before this video. And uh, Jen was out there taking care of him during this episode and finally said, this is enough. This kid needs to be checked. Something is very definitely wrong. Uh, so mom was responsive to it and said, yes, we'll go ahead and test him and, and or find out what's going on. They discovered the sickle cell trait, and you already know the story about the, what the doctor said. Most of his cramping is in the lower body. Most of his cramping lasts about 15 minutes. Um, uh, it was an eye-open experience, and even Kyrie, when he and I were talking, and again, I asked him the same thing, you know, I need to ask your permission, I need to get all these documentation, am I allowed to share your story? He said, absolutely. He said, I want people to know my story. I want people to understand that I'm trying really, really hard to take care of my body, and I'm still getting sick, and I'm still having episodes. Let's see if I can make it work. I'll be excited if this works. <laughs> He's re telling his mom's ah, number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I got it in my neck. It's something in my neck. <laughs> this is your neck too? Oh, baby! <laughs> <laughs> mm. My neck. My... <laughs> <laughs> Yo. Yes. Now, I know his friends are laughing, uh, but at this time, this was before the diagnosis. Uh, they did not know that's what he had. Uh, but the, and it was happening so often that you know the, the, the kids were kind of teasing and making fun of him. This was the last straw for Jen. This was the one where she called my, and that's, I don't know if you caught on to the numbers he's speaking out. He's actually telling the coach his mom's phone number so that they can call her. They called an ambulance. This is when he got tested. So. In my first column, I have the information about that episode. He was cramping for about 15 minutes. Jen said that his muscles were like jello. It, there was no tight muscles. It was all jello. Um, she said, uh, he told me that on a scale of 1 to 10, it was a 5. And so you saw his, his reaction to it, and that was a 5. Okay? Uh, he was completely exhausted after the episode. He didn't want to do anything. He was exhausted. He had gone to the doctor anyway. I mean, he actually had gone to the ER for that one. Um, he, he did say that the six or seven that he had before that were pretty similar to that. This was the first one that really had kind of got in his neck. Most of the time it was lower body, legs, maybe a little bit of arms. But this was the first one I think that scared everyone because it was his neck. Um, uh, the next day he felt fine. He hydrated, he ate, he rested, he felt fine. You know, it did take a while for him to get cleared, but he did get back. So I asked, I asked them both, I said, are you still having those? He said, oh, yes, I still am. You know, and that's when Jennifer uh, later on pulled me aside and told me about the whole meal issue and the mom and dad issue and all that kind of stuff. Um, he said the lasting, again, still lasts about 15 minutes. Uh, he is drinking at least a gallon of water a day. He is taking electrolytes. Um, uh, the one that he had in May, it felt like cramps and tightness. Oxygen was brought out right away. I mean, the coaches and the athletic trainer know this is part of the plan. Oxygen is given. Uh, she has written it into her plan that EMS is called. Dad is not real happy about this because anytime he has a sickling event now, he does go to the hospital. Mom is, is supportive, but, you know, she's also being uh, not difficult, but just doesn't understand why these events are happening. He said on a scale of 1 to 10, the one in May was an 8. 
Uh, the blood work showed he was well hydrated, his sodium levels were low, and his kidney GFR was rate, rate was low. So he has been out, or as of the phone call, he was still out because of his kidney levels. And they're worried about kidney disease and kidney damage because of the sickle cell trait and the continued uh, issues. Uh, the next day he felt fine. And I think this week was the week he was supposed to get cleared. I haven't followed up this week. But he felt fine. He said, it was just a horrible episode, a horrible 15 minutes of my life, and then I'm fine. So what do we do with all this information? Well, what we already are doing is we are looking at their medical history. We're getting the red flags up when we have the medical diagnosis. I mean, us as athletic trainers, we're trying to be proactive, OK? Um, we have hydration stations, okay? As much as we hate lifting up those coolers and filling the coolers and, hey, there's a freshman kid, come on, <laughs> you know, take it out for me. Um, we, are, we are doing our part, from my understanding, and, and making sure that our athletes are hydrated. Um, you know, Jen said, she goes, I've got emergency numbers on speed dial, not just EMS, but she says, I have mom and I have dad, and they're on automatic speed dial, and so do the coaches. So when, uh, like with Kyrie, when he's having an event, Mom is getting three or four phone calls right about the same time. And that's like, yep, it's time. Get over here. Um, she does have oxygen. Knowing the weather, you know, and I always tease my husband about it because he and his uh, good friend, or coach, I, I think they should be meteorologists if they ever retire. I don't think they'll ever retire. But, I mean, I didn't even really have to check the weather because they knew it for me. But we do need to understand the weather. We do need, do need to understand heat index and humidity and, and cold and wind index because it does play a part. And it's not just the heat, but it's the cold also. Uh, and then understanding the extra time between repetitions, especially when it comes to timed runs. I mean, that's pretty much a no-brainer. We're following those. We're doing okay with that. Uh, strongly suggested to consider, have a designated cooling off area, whether it be inside with the air conditioning, set aside in the shade where it's definite difference in temperature. Uh, have an in-service for coaches, administrators, and school nurses. Good luck with that one, but try. Uh, having parent and student athlete education. Uh, I've had a lot of athletic training students that go through my programs are like, I don't want to talk to parents. You know what? Parents are okay. They're not that bad. Once they, once they get to know you, once they know that you're working to help out their baby, they're going to love you. Um, have them consult with a nutritionist. Uh, consult with their personal physicians along with your our team physician. Um, the only reason I put the fire marshal, there were a couple different stories as I was doing all the research where there are certain areas where they were not allowed to have a tank of oxygen because of fire codes. So in your area, that may be just something to investigate. I don't know if it is or it isn't. I've never had that issue where I've been, I've had an oxygen tank. You know, I just made sure it wasn't standing up. Um, Consult with EMS, things that we already do, and know when the athlete needs to stop. Really just know the signs, have them be ready to stop. Um, indicators of emergency situation, I just know, looked at the time and I'm a little over, so I'm going to try to finish. Um, fever of 100 or 1 or higher, okay, I know that this is not exactly heat stroke, but it's enough to be a red flag. Chest pain, shortness of breath, getting really tired, having swelling in the stomach, having headaches, Weakness or loss of feeling, I mean, that was that whole dead leg thing that Herschel was describing to me. Uh, basically, pain that will go away. So it is looking like a heat episode uh, more than anything else. When it comes to patients with sickle cell trait, their muscle cramping will be uh, a muscle cramp without the spasm. They will, their legs, their arms, everything will feel like jello. Okay, but they're going to have that pain. They will be very thirsty. They will be very tired. They may lose consciousness. Get them to the hospital. Uh, I was reading an article on exertional rhabdomyolysis, and I'll go through this real quick. I, I really like this chart, and it was in part of that article in, in uh, I believe Natalie is going to put my long PowerPoint up as a handout. I included this in there. But basically, it's a chart. If the big victim collapses during training, are they responsive, yes or no? No, call EMS. Yes, do your primary survey, then call EMS. Okay, but either way, call EMS. Can't stress that enough. They are your friend. Um, Texas, I wanted to share this information with you because a lot of you nodded your head saying, no, my athletes do not know what's going on uh, with their own bodies. You can contact the Texas Department of Health. Well, not you. The parents can. And, and I, I encourage you, if you suspect that your athlete may have it, 
introduce the parents or maybe even do a general in-service about sickle cell, if you, I know we have lots of free spare time, uh, about sickle cell and share this information with them. They are eye-opening. The two ladies that I worked with to get not only information but even some personal information were amazing. And, and I wanted to share a little bit of my own personal story. My son is adopted, okay? And so when we uh, got all his paperwork at adoption, there was a lot of information missing. And we knew that. Okay, and uh, my son, it, it looks exactly like my husband, so we're thinking, there's no way he would have sickle cell trait. And um, so I, when I'm talking to these uh, ladies at the Texas Department of Health, I said, what are the chances I can find his records? All I had to do was prove who I was, that I was his legal mom, and give the specific information they needed about him. And that day, actually within an hour, they found his paperwork, they sent it to me, it's mine now. Okay, it is that easy to find it. So your own, your own athletes, their parents can get that, e that, paper, that information easier than I can. So definitely information that you want to share, and they were wonderful to work with. I wanted to just say thank you uh, very much to some of these people. Um, like I said, I had a lot of interviews uh, when it came to uh, sickle cell, did a lot of reading. Uh, it, the last two months have been quite an eye-opening experience. Jerry uh, is the one that really gave me the idea. We were kind of just throwing out ideas, uh, you know, what, what is it that athletic trainers really need to kind of heads up about? And he's like, well, I've got a couple sickle cell people. We don't know enough about that. And so hopefully this PowerPoint presentation, especially those of you that have sick, someone with sickle cell trait, uh, is helpful. Uh, but anyway, want to thank these uh, individuals that gave me support. And thank you very much.